Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. And I have once again with me, Teresa Grieco, uh, nurse practitioner and traditional naturopath. And I'm um, Chris Wilson, health coach, nutritionist here at Foundations and Wellness, and uh, really excited to talk about stress and hormones. Because who doesn't have stress today? And uh, who doesn't have imbalanced hormones? It seems almost everyone. But um, how are you doing this afternoon? Real good. Good. How are you? I'm well. Ready to dive into this topic. I know we're kind of short on time, so let's just get right on in and talk about some of the hormones. I think when most women talk about hormones, or I, I think when that word gets thrown out there, um, sex hormones are the first ones that come to my mind, like estrogen or progesterone, testosterone, but there's so many more hormones than just those three, and uh, so many more influences uh, from our environment that can mess those hormones up, and yeah. mainly when we're talking about stress and stress hormones, uh, cortisol is a, a not a friendly foe. Um, so tell us a little bit about how uh, too much stress, talk about first just types of stress and how that can play a role in upsetting our hormones. Yeah. Well, let's, before we even do that, let's just explain what hormones are. So hormones, it's just a really fancy word for a messenger. Mes hormones bring a message to the cell and drop off the message for the cell to do what it needs to do. So when we think hormones, like you said, a lot of people think estrogen, testosterone, things like that, but insulin's a hormone. Our thyroid makes hormone. Cortisol is a hormone. Melatonin's a hormone. There's lots of things, right? We have lots of hormones and they all do different things and they all have different messages that they can say. So just knowing that super important so that we realize, okay, what is it? It's, it takes kind of the, the mysticism out of the fancy word, you know, hormone, right? So yeah. cortisol and stress, that's our two things that go hand in hand. And then we can talk later about how that impacts blood sugar um, as well, because that they, they all kind of go hand in hand. So what happens when we are under stress? So stress can happen from within our body and it can happen from without intrinsic inside, extrinsic outside, right? Most people think stress, they think of the extrinsic um, stress. So I like to use this. Uh, analogy, just think about it. The lion is chasing you and you got to get the heck out of Dodge, right? You got to run away. So think about what happens when we're under stress. When, if a lion is chasing me, do I want to stop and eat my, you know, breakfast burrito? I don't think so. Right. I, I got to go. So, and I got to run away and what, what do I need? What uh, parts of my body do I need to work ideally and optimally when I'm under that kind of stress? Well, my muscles, I need to be strong. That's how you he hear of stories of people that, you know, like the car falls off the jack onto the guy and the neighbor comes over and lifts the car off of the guy because all his muscles got this boatload of energy all of a sudden to be able to do the thing that he had to do. So our muscles need lots of energy and they need lots of glucose. That's why cortisol and glucose go hand in hand, or that's one way we can see that happen. The other thing that happens is we, we don't need to eat. We don't need to digest our food. So digestion slows way down when we're under stress. We also don't take time to sleep, right? We don't need to sleep when we're, you know, the tiger's chasing us. So all of our dineural patterns, the, the patterns that, you know, cause us to, to go to sleep when we're supposed to wake up when we're supposed to, they often get impacted and shifted around because of that. Um, some of the other things that we need to be able to have the energy is our heart rate goes up. So our heart's pounding, pounding, pounding. Think about running away. We we are able to grab a hold of a whole lot more energy. And you know, our, our blood circulates oxygen, and oxygen is what gives our the tissues, all the tissues in our body, the ability to do all the things that it does without dying. So our heart rate increases, our blood pressure um, often goes up to be able to get us out of the way. So, and everything I'm talking about with that, when the lion is chasing us, that's a part of our nerves, nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system. It's part of the, the big blanket of the autonomic. In other words, it's automatic. We don't have to think about it happening. We don't have to think about our heart beating. We don't have to think about breathing a little bit faster. It just happens, right? We don't stop and think about it. But the other side of things uh, so the two parts of the autonomic is sympathetic. That's the fight or flight. And then the other side is the parasympathetic or the rest and digest peace and at ease. 
when we're calm and everything is going great, that's when we stop and eat our lunch. That's when we can take a nap. That's when we sleep better. Our, we digest our food better. Things move better. We're just in a, in a more relaxed state. Things are just kind of the way we want them to be to kind of go and flow. Our heart rate tends to be lower. Our blood sugar tends to be lower, more stable. That's where we want to live. That's where we want to live all the time. But often what happens is, you know, we don't live in the jungle in India, right? So the lion doesn't chase us. But uh, let's see, my boss demands that I get this project done right away. Um, my kid just decided that was a good idea to uh, dump, and this actually really happened to me, dump an entire thing of hot cocoa mix all over the kitchen floor. And then uh, she did it again. <laughs> And so I was like, oh, you know, and so those things that stress us out, you know, create that stress in our life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can be a one-off and sometimes it's there, 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 there every day, every day. You know, the, the, those of us, like I, I worked in an ICU for years and years and years and also the emergency department, just going into work, I could feel my stress level increase a lot of times, just knowing that I didn't know what I was going to face. I may not get to go to the bathroom. I may not get to eat my lunch. It could be on my feet. People could die. You know, it was a very stressful environment. And that was all the time. It was just always there, always there. And so sometimes the, the, the stressors can ebb and flow and they can be episodic. But sometimes, and a lot of times, it can be chronic. That's when we run into problems, when stress creates, um, it, it is, when it's a more chronic situation, it has a really great impact in our body and and not in a positive way. It almost sounds like uh, we're just burning on adrenaline all day, especially in today's uh, environment with society always on demand for everybody. And I know we see a lot of uh, business driven women, entre entrepreneur type women who are, you know, very type A run businesses or work in like um, high C level executive type positions in corporate world. And instead of a tiger chasing them, it's more so these tasks, these to-dos that they have to accomplish and trying to find food. And uh, a, a woman's body is built a lot different than a man's body. Yeah. And they can't take on the demand uh, that maybe some of us men can. And having to snack or eat in a hurry, it's not good for anybody, but more so for women, especially when hormones are at play. And you mentioned you know, the thyroid hormone, insulin um, our sex hormones, uh, adrenaline is a hormone, all of these various hormones that are secreted can get really, uh, dampered just by a stressful lifestyle. So just helping a person calm their brain up here to reassess their everyday situation or just how they approach their day by how they begin and start that morning. Cause a lot of us, we have kids, we have children, we wake up, we rush out the door, drop them off at school or what have you. And then we're on our way to work and we get stuck in these routines. And you think about, you haven't even walked foot into your office yet. And you've already been stressed in the morning, just trying to get everybody together, pack lunches, pack schools, uh, yourself ready, <laughs> um, kiss your spouse out the door and then run into the car and then boom, traffic. Yeah. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And you have yeah. all of these thoughts <laughs> that are just firing. Yep. And, um, it's crazy because how can we help people understand that if we can just reassess the very beginning of our day, it'll help set us up for the way our day will go. Now, it's not to say that life isn't going to throw us curveballs or we're not going to have um, certain tasks that pop up on our desk that need to be uh, focused our attention immediately. I mean, these things do happen, but if we're already struggling with health conditions, symptoms, of whatever. These are kind of like, I always talk about the automobile analogy that if the red light to the check engine came on in our car, how long would we wait before taking it in for a checkup for diagnostics? Yep. Most people wait a day to see if the light goes off or if it was like a one-off, like you just mentioned, and then take the car in. But when it comes to our health, it's oftentimes we neglect it. We push it off. And symptoms are really just those warning signs from the body that something is wrong and the body needs to get checked out. Unfortunately, we go to the doctor and the labs are normal or it's kind of like all in their head. And this kind of spills over into testing. Oftentimes people will test hormones in the blood and they they are appearing normal. Can you talk a little bit about why that is and what kind of tests would you recommend for hormones? 
Yeah. Yeah. And I want to, uh, when we're done with that, I want to circle back to what you said about the start of the day and things like that. Cause I think that's super important. And and I, I want to yeah. talk about, you know, things that we can do to kind of tame the tiger coat, so to speak. So <laughs> hormones, I was one of those. I got, I went to the doctor for years, had all these issues and, Oh, everything looks normal. Everything looks normal. Well, that's great. And because what happens and the reason for that is we, are, so I, we, we've used this analogy before. If this is our cell on our cell membrane on the membrane, there's these little, it's called integral membrane proteins. It's a fancy word for say, it's like a docking station. You know how you watch star Wars and they bring the, the, the spacecraft in and they dock at the space station. That's, we have these docking stations on our cell membrane. That's where the messengers sit. So when the we have the circulating hormone and the messengers are sitting on the cells trying to deliver their message, oftentimes when this cell membrane is inflamed, the message doesn't go through. It's like the door is halfway open or not even open so that only part of the message gets through or not any of it at all. Or maybe some work and some don't. So, and remember the, the, the messenger is coming to deliver his message to tell the cell what to do. So mm -hmm. if the message doesn't delivered or does, or only gets delivered in part, then the cell either doesn't respond because it didn't ever get the message. It's like the mailman forgot to put the mail through the slot or uh, it only gets partially through like my dog goes and eats my mail sometimes. Maybe I get half the letter, right? So if the cell doesn't know what and that actually happened this week, if the cell doesn't get the message, it doesn't know what to do. That's what creates the symptoms because the hormones are out here. The messengers are out here. They're not getting into the cell or only in part. And so then we start feeling the symptoms that we have. Let's just take, we talked about thyroid before. So we're tired. We can't lose weight. We're cold all the time. Our skin is dry. Our nails are brittle. Our hair falls out. Uh, you know, whether it's low or high, sometimes it affects our heart rate. Um, constipation. Constipation, right. Can't oh, lose weight. Can't. Yeah, we said that. Can't lose weight. All those things. There's all those reasons, all those symptoms that we have in our, our labs are normal because the messengers, are, the messages, the messengers are trying to deliver the message and it doesn't happen. It can't get in or it only gets in in part. So the cells can't do what they're supposed to do. And then, you know, things start to go awry. Is there a better test than measuring in the blood to help assess our hormone status or to better look at, you know, how much stress we're actually under that could point us in a better direction? Because I think, you know, if you ask anybody, they're going to say, well, what person doesn't have stress in their life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if blood work isn't really a good assessment for you know, I would say it's okay to measuring if you're doing like um, hormone replacement therapy to kind of see where the levels are, yeah. but we don't want to manipulate levels. We want to help the person yep. feel better. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. So to ask your question, yes, it's for, for, for some hormones. Yes, there are better tests, not all hormones. I have a patient um, that I has thyroid issues. She has autoimmune thyroid condition. And we try, we've been working on cell inflammation. That's like been, and well, first of all, she actually came to me because of her gut, right? So we fixed her gut or at least mostly fixed her gut. Um, because it's still, you know, she's young and the weekends happen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we mostly did that. So a lot of those gut symptoms, she, she had chronic antibiotic use. So totally wrecked her gut for years and years and years. So we really been working on restoring her gut, got things going there. And, you know, I said, okay, now we can start talking about your thyroid. Let's start working on that. So we've been supporting that with some different things. And we weren't, and she was feeling 90% better. And I said, you know what, let's just try something different. So we, we actually did try, um, we started her on a, a very low dose prescriptive medication of thyroid hormone until I can wake up her cells so they can start working the way that they're supposed to. And um, when I did her lab work, so her lab work all looked normal, except for the antibodies that made me know that I knew she had the thyroid, um, autoimmune thyroid. All the other labs are normal. Like she didn't have any, any abnormal lab values as far as the actual level of the hormones. 
Mm -hmm. but she had symptoms, lots and lots and lots of symptoms. So I said, okay, let's do a little bit of this. We'll give you some nutri um, nutraceuticals that'll help feed your thyroid the things that it needs. So we had started that a while ago and, um, and then, you know, we get, started doing this. So the next time I did her lab work after the first um, time she started taking the medication, it actually looked like she didn't, she needed more medication, but she's like, I feel great. I don't have anything to report. And I'm like, all righty, then that's what we're going to go on. Because sometimes we, I, the labs are a good place to start, but they're not the end all be all for all the reasons that we just said, I right. go more based on how do you feel? What mm -hmm. are you experiencing? Are your symptoms worse? Are they, are they better? What are they? Does it look like if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, duck right? <laughs> so that, so that's what we're going to, you know, that's, that's the approach that I took. And, and, you know, of course I told her the correlation with her diet and Hash the whole sure. Hashimoto's like, I'm like, dude, you got to stop eating gluten. She's like, I do Monday through Friday. I'm like, but you go out to eat on the weekends. Yeah. I said, hidden gluten. It's all over the place. You cannot, it, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have that name, but it's in so much of the takeout stuff that we have at restaurants. It's just in the sauces and the, you know, the seasonings and things like that, the breading and all that. And it was sort you know, it was an eye opening moment. And so, you know, and beer, people don't think about it. It's being, it's in beer. Of course it is. You know, that's what part of what it's made out. It's grain. It's a grain. So I once heard that all beer is, is bread in a can. It's exactly right. And that's <laughs> why when a lot of people drink beer, they get so bloated because they have the sensitivity to the wheat and they don't realize that that's what it is. It's not just the fuzzy bubbles in the, in the beer. <laughs> so. Well, you did yeah. mention though, that you uh, tested her because most doctors that I would say in the conventional space probably wouldn't do this. They would just run TSH, but you mentioned a full thyroid panel. Plus oh, yeah. Thyroid. And that helped key in on pet I mean, peeve of mine. <laughs> so if you wouldn't have known that, we wouldn't have known that there was uh, an immune disorder where yeah. her immune system was attacking her thyroid gland. Yeah. And I think that's a huge takeaway for people to understand is that, yeah, when we measure thyroid hormone, it's great to look at that in the blood. Sex hormones and cortisol is great to measure in urine or saliva. You can get a more accurate picture of what is going on under the hood. Um, but the antibody piece is so important to yeah. see if, you know, you can arrest the uh, thyroid process from ever occurring in the first place or slowing yeah. it down or even yep. putting it into remission. Yeah. So the, so uh, huge pet peeve of mine, I would, I was traditionally taught as a nurse practitioner, oh, you just run the TSH with reflex to free T4. And what that really means is if the TSH is normal, then that other test doesn't get run. Okay, well, I, we talked about this before, but let's talk about it again. So the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, it's the brain, the anterior yeah. pituitary gland releasing the hormone called the thyroid stimulating hormone. And it speaks to the thyroid and it says, make, it says make hormone. And the thyroid's like, okay, I'll make T4. And then the T4 goes to the liver and gets converted to T3, which is what we use. And so what I, what I measure is not just the total T3 or T4, I measure the free, meaning it's not bound. That's what's the usable form. The other thing that's, and that's the, the basics that I start with besides the, the um, antibodies. So remember, these are all messengers, right? All those are messengers. Antibodies are antibodies. That's the immune system. That's a different, that's a different duck, right? So when I measure the antibodies, had I not measured the antibodies, I would not have found out that she, her immune system was making antibodies against her own organ, right? Creating and symptoms. It's a, and which is creating her symptoms. And the, the other thing that I do, once I run those beginning things, if I, you know, see something, the other thing I want to know is when the thyroid uh, hormone goes to the liver and it gets converted to, to T3. It also can go down the reverse T3 pathway. I literally had a doctor tell me one time when I was the patient, he said, Oh, I never checked that. That doesn't mean anything. I was like, okay, well, if this thyroid hormone can be converted one of two ways, I want it to go down the T3 pathway, but if it goes down the reverse T3 pathway, 
more so than it's going down this way, something's wrong. The body's not yeah. doing what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to go down the reverse. Uh, I'm sorry. It's supposed to go down the T3, not the reverse pathway. So right. if I see a, re and I actually did have a, a, a different patient this week, her reverse T3 was super high. And I'm like, okay, well, that's why. And her, and her normal, like her other level levels were not out of range, but they weren't in what I call the baby bear, that sweet spot, not too cold, right. not, not too hot, not too cold, just right. That's where I want them. That's the functional range where when they're in that functional range, that's when things behave the way they're supposed to. And then we don't have as many symptoms. Her reverse C3 was way high and and a normal doctor, A, would have seen that normal T3, T4 and said, oh, you're fine mm -hmm. because, but she wasn't. And she was clearly having symptoms, which totally changed the game. So would have maybe got put on a drug. Yeah. <laughs> or, if she pressed hard enough. Yeah. The doctor yeah. would be like, well, here, try this and come back and we'll reevaluate. But yeah. And I, 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 the, the one thing I just love about the, that pa the first patient I was talking about is she really wants to do the right thing. The other thing that we've been working on is her hormones, like her, her, um, sex hormones. She was on birth control for years and years and years, totally, totally messed up her ovaries because her ovaries, like that's, what's responsible for making a lot of the hormones. Mm. And then when the, and here's the other caveat, when the ovaries can't do their job to make progesterone the adrenals take over. And if the adrenals are all wonked out because they're just like tapped out from the stress, uh -huh. they don't even make progesterone. That's where postmenopausal women, where, you know, when everything starts to shut down, the ovaries start, stop working, the adrenals take over making the progesterone. So maybe things don't, you know, maybe symptoms aren't so bad. If the adrenals are like, like it was me, that was my situation. My adrenals, when the first time I measured my cortisol level, it was like, it was like, she's dead. We need to resuscitate her. You know, I supposed to, you're supposed to have this nice, like Rocky mountain, then a valley. And I was like, eh. flat line. <laughs> flat line. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Cause you had some uh, questions that made me think, or some thought provoking questions here, like an aha moment. Um, for women, because I'm not a woman, obviously, and I don't have <laughs> I don't have as much estrogen and progesterone as a woman would. And for but various you still reasons. do. Yeah. I still do. And, and I, I don't have want to have it, <laughs> but not as much as I do. We have yep. just around. Yeah. And it's been balanced because you said about birth, uh, oral contraceptives. And I know a lot of women who suffer from PCOS, they are given a contraceptive to help them with this, right? And that can mess more things up. Yeah. Uh, and you have this whole, um, I think, you know, think take a ball of yarn and unravel it and then wad it all up into this mess. And sometimes hormones can be like unraveling this ball of yarn into yeah. a more linear process because yeah. a lot of times PCOS is, you know, insulin resistance, insulin, hormone, and then testosterone. Like sugars, it's like, bloop, 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 bloop. yep. And they can't understand. So, you know, what we're talking about here is stress is it's any influence internal or external that causes or leads to malfunction. Yeah. The mental, emotional, spiritual, fear, yeah. worry, excitement, or anxiety, yeah. the job status, relationship, financial, yeah. lack of purpose, uh, yeah. negative perceptions and bad attitudes. And that's, uh, that's why I was, I forgot to mention, those are the intrinsic things, the things inside of us, right? The attitudes, the mindsets, the beliefs, the disbeliefs, or it can even be the, the inflammation. So emotionally, mentally it can be the thoughts and the beliefs and the values but then from a physical standpoint, intrinsic stressors could just be that inflammation that we feel day after day after day that negatively drives so much stuff. And so many people, even within the health, uh, holistic health space, I think neglect or don't even tap into, I guess, because, you know, professionally, we're not licensed counselors or whatever. So we kind of just chalk that stuff off to the side. But I think it does have a huge play into our health if you're not 100%. helping a person understand what's going on up here and how that their internal the way they just internalize life can express in a physical way yep. when we help them to clean that up just like their diet it can just you know yep. paint a much more beautiful picture for their health to overcome some challenges i just so talked to that people. same patient about that this week uh, so i'm a firm believer in the mind body connection right we are not just a physical body we are, you know, we have this 
soul part of us that's our mind our will our emotions and then spirit mm-hmm. that's what gives us life and they overlap all the time and i and i tell people so think about if you have a fit you can have a physical thing that'll impact our emotions if i stub my toe really oh, yeah. hard or hit my hit my thumb with a nail uh you know hit my thumb with a hammer as i'm trying to nail i'm gonna get tears in my eyes right that's an emotional response to a physical thing physical pain but vice versa a real extreme example is something called broken heart syndrome takasubo is the name doctor doctor it was a japanese doctor named dr takasubo who first discovered this phenomenon where you can have a, a person who has crushing chest pain you know even radiating down their armor jaw they do a 12 lead EKG. They have big tombstone changes in their EKG. It looks like they're having a heart attack. <clears throat> they take them into the cath lab, you know, run, run the camera up to look at their coronary arteries and they're perfectly clean. Bring them out. I, I literally, this happened to me a couple of years ago when I worked in that department, I had this happen. I had a patient that, um, I, you know, I was recovering her afterwards and and I said, ma'am, tell me what's been going on in your life. And she's like, well, I'm just so sad. She was this beautiful, you know, elderly woman. She said, my cat, I had him for 20 years and he was my everything. He was all I had and he just died. Well, she, she had a broken heart, like, and her broken emotional heart manifested as what appeared to be a broken physical heart. And then when, you know, then everything went away, the pain went away and, you know, it it was a real thing. So you, we cannot expect that what happens in our emotions or our mind do not impact us physically. It happens all the time. This is where I wanted to talk about the connection with the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is the longest nerve in the body runs from the brain all the way down through the digestive tract. When we are in, it's, it's part of what controls things like our heart rate, our blood pressure, and even that forward motion in our in our digestive tract. So when we're in rest and digest in parasympathetic tone, the vagus nerve, you know, is kind of running the show and everything is kind of great and it's kind of going along easy peasy. We have something called heart rate variability that that um, fluctuation of from one heartbeat to the next is real flexible. That's what we want. When, when the vagus nerve is um, kind of offline and doesn't do what it's supposed to do, and ep- epinephrine, adrenaline, which is what, by, by the way, it's what we give when we're trying to resuscitate a dead person to get their heart rate going, we give them adrenaline. It, it, the vagus nerve kind of stimulates the heart rate to go up. And then the variability is like, it like marches out because you want your heart to just do, 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 do what it's supposed to do. Mm-hmm. When when we do things like deep breathing, you know, guided imagery, meditation, um, affirmation, staying in attitude of gratitude, things like that, the vagal, our vagal tone is real, it's real nice. And, and, and our heart rate variability kind of fluctuate, everything is just beautiful. But when we're in stress, we're, or we're in stress, stress mode, and the sympathetic tone takes over, it's like, boom, 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 boom. It, it doesn't work. Like it doesn't happen. So, and that's when our digestion gets all messed up. That's when we are cold all the time. That's when we can't sleep. Cause what happens is, so cortisol is, is really a hormone. Not, it not only, <coughs> excuse me. It not only stimulates, uh, cortisol not only stimulates, um, the fight or flight response, but it also, it's like, it does good things. It like wakes us up. That's how we wake up in the morning. Right. So the, it's called the cortisol awakening response. It start cortisol production starts to to increase about three in the morning and it Mm -hmm. peaks at 7am. And then it goes down like the Rocky mountains and into a Valley for the rest of the day. That's what's supposed to happen. And that's what we want to have happen. People who are stressed out, Initially, if you measure that cortisol awakening response, their cortisol level is like really high and maybe stays high throughout the day, or maybe it's normal and um, they have uh, a normal morning, but then it just stays up throughout the afternoon. So everybody's a little bit different, but what happened, like what happened to me is that that over time, 
the adrenals like can't keep up. And then we just, it's like flatline. We don't make enough. And then we end up, and that's why we feel like dog tired all the time. So I think no, I you're absolutely right. covered you're everything right. that I wanted to say there. Yeah. Yeah. Just to kind of uh, loop back around to the thyroid issues and just the hormonal imbalances or um, hormone havoc, wrecked hormones, whatever people say out there. Cortisol can play a role. Insulin can, stress can play a role. Um, I'm trying to collect my thoughts because there's so much stuff that you said. Um, the okay. thyroid, okay, so the thyroid and adrenals, those two are obviously connected because I, I just wonder if how many women were able to support their adrenals, their thyroid would improve. Yeah. And if how many people would, um, as painful as it may be, open up some of these past wounds and deal with some of the emotional trauma a lot of it, you know, we've occurred um, from childhood, uh, adverse childhood events. We've yep. all got some type of trauma that yep. we don't even know that we're holding on to maybe. And that's what and I talked to with this person. So you bring up a really good point. I, I, when I talk to this patient, I do something called neuroemotional technique, which is where we go and we heal some of those areas. Because what happens when we're a child, we have events happen and we perceive it through our immature mental capacity to process. We don't have language for it. And we don't, we don't know how to, even neurologically, we don't know how to process the things that happen to us. So I use a really strong, <clears throat> funny example. I'll say, you know, my, I don't eat my dinner and my dad says, that I can't have dessert and I go to bed without dessert and I think my dad hates me. Well, no, my dad doesn't hate me, but that's my perception, right? I'm three years old. I want my dessert. My dad hates me. Then something <laughs> else happens in life that reminds us of that time when I went to bed without dessert, then this event gets connected to this event and happens over and over and over to when we just, and, and the other thing that happens is we actually release these peptides, these proteins in our brain in the parahippocampal area that they, they actually release and that solidifies that thing. And we just lay these like road tracks in, in our brain every time we relive that event. So then everything is deeply ingrained and it makes it really hard to feel, to actually feel anything any differently about that because we perceived this original thing. So NET goes back and kind of unwinds the original thing and you don't have to even mention the thing that happened you don't have to feel it but if you allow yourself to feel it the more you have the physiological response you know maybe the tears the stronger the ability of that thing to change and then this thing gets unwound and then all that other stuff kind of goes away so one of the studies that it's been and they've been done like there's a foundation that's done like thousands of studies on this and they are blessed to have this group of doctors at um, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson University, who helped to run these programs, these studies. They had uh, one study, it's my, favorite, it's my favorite study. They did it on a group of people who were cancer survivors. And to qualify to be enrolled, they had to have had some kind of traumatic thing happen regarding their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so they had the people write down the story of the day they got told they had cancer. They put them into an MRI and they, and the MRI was of the brain where it would light up in color when that protein that I talked about would, was released. So they read the story to them while they were in the MRI and the people are crying and, you know, their brains lighting up. They bring them out. They do three to five sessions of NET. They put them back in, did another MRI. And not only were they not emotional, like they could hear the story and it didn't like you know, really wreck them emotionally, their brain didn't light up. It actually changed their brain chemistry. They've done wow. uh, studies with a heart rate variability. Same thing. Read a story. Their heart rate variability is like, boom, 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 you know, marching out, no fluctuation, do NET a couple sessions. And now there's nice, this like flexible uh, heart rate variation, which is what we want. So and for those that don't know, what, what do they use heart rate variability for? Well, heart rate variability is, is what I said to measure the state of stress, uh, within a person, how, how good is your vagal 
they call it vagal tone. How good is your vagal tone? Again, are you constantly staying in the flight or flight where you, your body and your brain think that you're in fight or flight all the time, even if nothing's happening? Or are you able to adapt? It's a very, it's an adaptability measurement. How what are they using to measure it? Oh, here, um, I'll show you. It's, uh, let's see if I have it. Are they just checking for like, a, is it like when you measure for heart rate variability, are they checking for a pulse and just kind of taking a measurement off your pulse or? Here we go. I'll show you. So it's <clears throat> hooks up. This is the one that I use for the desktop. And I also have one that I use for my cell phone. Very cool. Yeah. Can so this, download this goes into or? my computer and okay. this goes onto my ear and you have, believe it or not, you have a pulse on your ear. And then the one that I use on my phone, it's the same company. It's called Heart. It's from HeartMath. The okay. one that I have for my phone plugs in to the the AV jack on my phone, and then I have the clip on my ear. And on my phone, I have something. The app is called Inner Balance. And let's see if I can show you what it looks like. So it's Inner Balance. And it brings up that little sunflower, like that little rainbow flower. Mm, I see a color wheel. It's 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 a color wheel. Yep. And okay. when I when I do when I take the test, so I turn it on to start the session, and the the flower shrinks and grows. And what what you need to do is just deep breathe in sequence with the flower going in and out and in and out. And what that does is sees it it detects how well your heart rate changes with all your deep breaths. And are you able to get into that nice cadence with that? And then from that, it, it and, you, and you can set it to do it for like five, 10, 15 minutes, however long you want to go. And okay. you can set it to have a lot of variability in the in influx or um, shrinking or growing. And so, and then it just measures it and it tells you um, what your heart rate variability. I don't have it on today because it's charging, but I also use something called an aura ring. Yeah, those are phenomenal for sleep. Yep. And it and it has a heart rate variability measurement in it too. Now mine, um <laughs> it doesn't I fall I sleep with my hand under my pillow and my hand sometimes falls asleep. And so it doesn't uh, measure very well. Like has like gaps. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. If I had sleep in a different position, maybe I have a, a good friend who he, it, he, that never happens. And he gets really great measurements. And I'm like, well, you must not sleep with your hand underneath your head. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, it, it just is a good way for you to measure what's happening with a heart rate. How, how adaptable are you to the stress in your life? Whether it's acute stress, like, you know, a, 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 a cat or just ran in front of the car and you, you like screech your brakes, so you don't hit the cat. Or whether it's like, you know, that like I have a, one of my patients works on Wall Street and they're under demand all the time. He works like 80 hours a week. And so I'm That's like, nice dress. so I recommended this to him. <laughs> yes. So overall, I mean, stress is often very well hidden and it may involve several layers of investigation, especially when we start to open up um, or you, you utilize the NET, the neuro emotional technique, and we start to open up hidden traumas or past traumas. I know um, unforgiveness is a huge one yeah. that people hold on to and harbor. And that can, uh, a lot of times there's cancer ties into those that harbor or hold on to unforgiveness. Bitterness uh, the, and unforgiveness are very directly related to cancer. cancer is very, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, thinking the other person's going to die. Uh, the scriptures mention that in the book of Hebrews. I, talk, I think it talks about a, don't let a, a, bit, a root of bitterness spring up. Yeah. And uh, bitterness is you think about how easy it is to hold bitterness. Now imagine that you're holding bitterness towards someone and this bitterness grows that root and it establishes itself. And we oftentimes have to go and dig that up and figure out how it got there and why, yeah. and then work through the ways of working on forgiving others. Yeah. And it's, it can be tough, especially if you've been wronged in such a way through um, child molestation or, or rape. And a lot of times women will hold in this unforgiveness toward the person because they were the victim and that's very hard you know it takes the right counseling the right mentor and the right um amount of prayer to get through that but it can be done and it's powerful because it's such a huge release and i Just tell people standpoint yeah I, I so i tell people when we do net 
we want to get them to a place of okayness, like neutrality. So, and I, and I do use the example, you know, what if I was raped? That thing would, that had happened was horrible. I, okay. you know, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And does it take, it doesn't excuse it. It doesn't explain it. It doesn't minimize, you know, the heinousness of it. However, it gets me to a place of, of neutrality where I can think and talk about it without it totally wrecking me every right. single time so that I don't relive it every time I talk about it. Same thing like the cancer, like I was talking about the science um, research article that they they did, the scientific study that they did, where mm -hmm. those, po those people <clears throat> that had that really awful experience with cancer could then think about it and it not like emotionally wreck them. And, and again, like it changes the brain chemistry. And sometimes it is the other part of it is sometimes when we have something happen, like the event is like the, the, the hub of the wheel and all of the emotions that we feel are like the spokes, you know? So like for me, when I, I the one memory that used to come up over and over and over, I was like, when is this ever going to go away? <laughs> I was four years old and I locked myself in a closet and I, that event came up over and over because I was afraid and I was, I felt abandoned. I felt rejected. Uh, I felt unloved. Um, I felt sad, you know, like all these things came up finally, like after, you know, we, a couple of, you know, sessions of doing it, it didn't come up anymore. But when I, that I, I physically had a hard time moving forward, no matter how much I ate right or uh, you know, exercise, or I did all the stuff that I thought was right. That like the, the emotional trauma. And I had a lot of trauma in my life. It, uh, that was the one thing that until I healed that part of who I was, it was really hard. And, and, and believe it or not, like autoimmune is like the body attacking itself. A lot of people with autoimmune have these emotional things that are just trapped. And, and, and one of the things NET is uses is the Chinese five elements, right? And all the elements are connected to different organs and different emotions. Like liver is anger. Gallbladder mm -hmm. is resentment. A lot of times people that have gallbladder liver issues have anger and resentment that they're not able to let go of. And when you heal the emotional things, say maybe when you don't, you know, when you have the anger and resentment, you see a lot of like cirrhosis, alcoholism. Those people are often ridden with anger, resentment, things like that. So it you know there's an overlap you know, all the time do you know some examples of what they hold anger or resentment towards i mean for everybody it's different it could be a lot of times it's parents you know teachers um people that are influence our lives at, from a very young age a lot of times it's parents how much of it in men do you see that hold resentment or anger toward uh not having a dad or a dad that was perhaps abusive or, you know, abandoned or the absence. family. Yeah. yeah. A lot. It happens a lot. Yeah. If, uh, women and women and men alike, um, you know, we, our parental influence is, is really, and, and sometimes, you know, like that parental influence can start in utero, you know, like wow. whatever the, just like, you know, how, when people talk to the baby belly, yeah. play music for the baby because they we know now that babies really do perceive the outside environment even while in utero mm -hmm. well think about it if the baby gets everything that it needs nourishment wise through the placenta and the umbilical cord they also perceive and re and experience the emotions that the mom experiences and so you know if you're in a and say though the mom is in an abusive marriage and she's you know gets put down all the time and she feels bad about herself and, or she's afraid or whatever, then that baby takes on that emotion. Um, I had a friend who their baby was extremely colicky and that's because the marriage at the time was very tumultuous and that baby just manifested with that fear and, and, and colic is like intestinal fear, right? It's anxiety and fear. And so, wow. <laughs> it, it's amazing how some of that stuff can transfer even at a young age. Just real quick, going back to another Bible verse there that you made me think of, of the child in utero or in the womb, being able to perceive the outside world is in the gospels. When we know that Elizabeth and Mary yeah. uh, heard the other and 
we hear the baby, the baby leapt, leapt in her in heart her and leapt in her uh, you know yeah for sure john the baptist leapt inside elizabeth when she you know when mary approached yeah that's really cool and uh you know, i think we gloss over stuff like that we don't think about you know the, the power and the impact behind us reading to the baby while in the mother's womb or playing music to it or having an argument um um or any type of um dissension or anything negative being able to impact the child's future yeah. in the womb from yeah, an emotional no, standpoint really does. so while we're gonna have to talk more about this um yeah. in the future on just exactly more net and what that is and how it helps people because i think more One of people my favorite do. topics <laughs> It, it really is because so many people, you know, we we hear we're inundated with on social media, take this supplement for this gut health problem or this supplement for this problem, improve your cognition here by taking this supplement or eliminate gluten. While those things are great, I don't see anybody talking about the uh, emotional network of our health and just so how you, yeah, trauma. You, you got to, so you got to, when we, when we do that, we have to talk about the most amazing book called The Biology of Belief by Dr. Bruce Lipton. He actually talks about the cell membrane and he was a straight on scientific biologist. And he started seeing how the cell membrane is like the, the brain of the cell and how mm -hmm. it can be influenced by our beliefs and our emotions. And so, you know, all of what we do is about the cell membrane and that's the real root cause. Well, think about it. If the cell membrane is influenced and by our belief system and our emotions, like, it's wild. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> like you, you can literally think with your thoughts, something that can excite you, truly excite you. Yep. I mean, just for other men out there, think of, you know, being intimate with your wife and the yeah. excitement, the arousal right. that occurs from that. Yeah. On the flip side of that, really have powerful. something that saddens you think of something of, of sad and yeah. just how it plays on your emotions there yeah. and all of these. So you think of how many people are, are depressed, yeah. uh, overtly anxious, or just struggle with certain emotions. Um, how much of that is tied back to, you know, their own mindset yes. or their own trauma that they yes. were brought up with in childhood because of, you know, lack or control or what have you from parents or whomever, and that plays a role in their adulthood with, like you said, autoimmunity or poor health or something. It's just wild to have, see that, you know, connection, the mind body connection. Yep. It's a, it's a real thing. It, it really is real. And I actually, I have had um, two or three patients over the last couple of years that when we did everything right. And in fact, the one she had spent, I was, when I was working in a different um, <clears throat> office and that we were able to offer IVs, I said to her, you spent tens of thousands of dollars. I don't want you to spend another dime until we work on some of the emotional things that you've gone through. She had, she was adopted. You know, she had several traumatic events that happened after adoption. Rape was one of them. And, um, and a lot of her pain was in that area, you know, like she had a lot of, you know, bladder pain and things like that in her womb. And, you know, like it was endometriosis, endometriosis was one of them. Yep. And so we, that's what I said. I said, we're not going to, I don't want you to do anything. You can take your multivitamin, you know, <laughs> you, but I'm not going to put you on anything special. You're not going to spend any more money on IVs. I want you to meet with me twice a week for an hour for the next three months until we work through some of this stuff. And when, when we were doing that regularly, her pain stopped it's even amazing. without doing anything else. When she stopped meeting with me for that, then Come she's back. like, this isn't working. The pain's coming back. And I'm like, that's because you stopped making appointments because <laughs> you're not <laughs> done. You had, you know, your well was deep. Your woundedness was deep and mm. there's a lot to deal with. A lot yeah, of emotional stuff wounds was, take a long time. Yeah. They, I mean, they don't take a long time with NET. They're, they, they heal immediately. However, it's, did we get to all the things? So the, the level, the more times that we have trauma, that we've experienced trauma, mm -hmm. the deeper, you know, the deeper uh, rooted those things are. So like I said, I could have one memory, but maybe there's 10 things connected right. to that one Spider memory. Off of. Yeah. So it's, it's layer by layer. It's like peeling away the layers of the onion sometimes. Absolutely. 
Yeah. It's, and it's for some really, people who, you know, have had some, you know, I mean, there's nobody that's been exempt from having any hurt and pain in their life. Right. Everybody has to some degree, but some have had a lot more than others, you know? Sure. I think of my sister who was molested and raped by my mom's second husband from the time she was seven up until 15. So you think of a seven year gap of your childhood, some formative years that were just robbed from her. And you live in this kind of victim mentality for a long time. And unfortunately, she still does. Because sometimes people don't know how to get the help, even though they're being told this is the kind of help you need. They don't know how to do that. And a lot of times they don't want to have to reprocess that pain again. Yeah. But they also, it, it gets so liberating too to put that stuff behind you and learn from it because oftentimes you can use that tragedy to help other people who are also stuck in that same well, I pain. I do what I do. You know, it's a, it's a yeah. true calling and a, a testimony to help others as well. Yeah. That's why, and, that's why I do what I do because I, it, because it did help me so profoundly mm -hmm. and because I had a lot of trauma, you know, there was a lot of stuff that happened. Uh, maybe not as much as when I was a young, young child, but definitely as a teenager on up, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and I was in, and, and I'm not talking just like emotional trauma, like physical trauma, you know, like I was in, a, I had a near death experience in a car accident that created a lot of emotional wounds in my, yeah. as well as physical things, you know? So, um, it can be, it can go either way. So you have both of them and it just kind of makes it, like you said, that spoke more of them, more yeah. Yeah. ways that we can have entanglement with our health. Uh, when you start to have, you know, that's what creates the perfect storm that allows our yeah. bucket to spill over. You yeah. think of the biochemical trauma from heavy metals and you think of yeah. the physical trauma from either a car wreck or you fall off a horse yeah. or yep. get hit in the head by a two by four for whatever reason, or that's right. you have the emotional abuse or sexual abuse or, you know, rape, molestation. And when you put all three of those together and then you wake up one day after you give birth to your child or you get COVID or whatnot. And it's like, Whoa, well, everything's not the same as what it was a year yeah. ago. So, and you try to start to identify and help people connect the dots. Yeah. And that's when they have these aha moments that you yeah. get to help them bridge the gap and overcome these little areas by working through it all. And, yeah. you know, we're uh, creatures of habit and we're people who want things like, you know, instantaneous instant gratification where, Hey, I just want to take the multivitamin and I want to be better tomorrow. And it's just not the case, you know, when we have to, you didn't get sick overnight and it's not going to get, you're not going to be whole overnight either. It Correct. does take. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Well, I do want to spend more time on this neuro emotional technique because I do believe it's an area that not many people discuss because uh, it can be a hard topic, you know, to talk about and understand, but you know, it's also coming from a place of uh, personal experience and passion. So I really think there's, there's a lot of empathy, empathy there for people to, um, <laughs> Just, you know, know and understand that mm -hmm. when there's a person who's gone through this, these things and, and genuinely and sincerely wanting to help from your own pain, and it's kind of brought about your own purpose of helping others. Mm -hmm. And so many people could benefit from just the healing of past emotional wounds and trauma, but we'll have to continue that talk on another one. I know you, I know you got to run, so yeah. we'll wrap this up. And thank you again for talking about this. I didn't know that stress and hope <laughs> gonna... This is unscripted <laughs> off the cuff. So there wasn't going to be any, hey, we're going to talk about this, this, and this. It's just kind of what came about. So really, really it awesome. Happened organically. It did. It was great. I enjoyed it. So thank you so much. And we'll catch up on another video. And you have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you again next week, Teresa. Right. Sounds great. You too. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.